All right. Welcome to the session on um, DDD and REST, domain-driven APIs for the web. Um, my name is Oliver Gierke. I work for a company called Pivotal. Has anyone ever heard of Pivotal? Okay, it's getting more and more people. Um, I'm in this, like, employed in the Spring Engineering team, so um, leading the Spring Data team there, which means that I usually everything that's related to data access and that's not taken care of by the core framework is landing on my team's desk at some point in time. Um, the Spring Data project is, on the very top level, it's an implementation of uh, Eric Evans' domain-driven design repositories concept. Um, and that's basically where the, where the connection came up when I started the project back in 2008 or something. It's, it's been a while. Um, and on the other hand, I've helped a lot of customers at Pivotal um, during my days in consulting and like even t until today to actually build RESTful APIs. Um, and it turned out, or I happened to, to see some kind of commonalities or even dependencies between the two, right? So um, basically bringing up the question, what are the parts of DDD that actually are kind of critical if you want to build a good and evolvable, evolvable REST API? Um, so what can, what can we learn from, from DDD in that regard? And also that there's some areas that don't really fit that nicely because one is, of course, a um, way of designing software and the other thing is an architectural style communication protocol if you take it into HTTP. Um, so the, there's some bridges to gap here as well. Right? And during the, those like 45 minutes right now, I'd like, basically like to cast some, some light on, onto those those two things and try to make those connections. Um, and we're going to look at DDD first, very specifically at, at certain points. Um, there's a good workshop today, uh, tomorrow actually by Michael Plurt about the more strategic design uh, parts of the book. Um, I'm going to focus more on the implementation side of things, uh, building blocks and what have you, and then basically in the second part of the talk, take that into the rest world and see, okay, where are the commonalities and uh, how can we bridge those those worlds? So let's get the elephant out of the room. Who has read the book? Okay, keep your hands up. Who read it till the not not too many actually? That's surprising. So keep your hands up. Who has read it till the very end? <laughs> That's the second question. Okay, um, it's a rather huge piece of of literature. Really, it's a it's a very good piece of literature. I've even seen there was a, at on Stack Overflow recently there was a. Um, a r ranking of books, and even amongst Java developers, I think it's the fourth or fifth uh, books, just like r after uh, after Josh Bloch's book and Concurrency in Practice and what have you. So um, it covers a broad range of topics. Um, I already mentioned strategic design, being basically um, how to actually decompose your system into yeah, bounded context in the first place, um, what kind of building blocks you might want to use to build up or fill those bounded contexts with, with meat. And then, actually, it's even starting at that point, um, trying to find a ubiquitous language or a language of the domain and how to actually um, implement that in the, in the code base. For the impatient of you, there's a, fortunately, there's an info queue variant of that, reclam style, so if you know these yellow German reclam books, 100 pages, it's basically just like boiling these things down. There's a couple of other books, really good books, if you're more like looking at it from a developer's point of view, like how do you actually implement things, uh, I can highly recommend the, the books from, from Vaughan Vernon, both DDD Distilled and Implementing Domain Driven Design. Very good ones. Um, you'll find this picture um, in the book. It's um, basically out laying out the building blocks. And I'd like to focus on uh, the four in the corner there, uh, not because they're in the global DDD context are somehow special, but because um, the way you design or whether you design them at all um, has a lot of influence in the way you actually can build a nice or rather bad REST API on top of that. So let's start with value objects. I want to cut this short because there's actually only one, one tiny aspect here that I want to use, uh, and value objects are a very good, very good example for that. So what's wrong with this code? besides the fact that it's stringly typed. There's just one, there's one other level that you can get this to, which is object-oriented code, right? It's like everything is an object and you cast it if you use it. Um, just kidding. No, the, the problem here is basically that if you have code like this that then actually takes an email 
an email, something that's actually a domain concept, right? And it's um, implemented as a string, then that code, that called code, can never be sure whether that string it was given is an email, actually. And I'm not sure who of you is actually a Java developer, with, but Java developers or, yeah, thanks. Um, the Java space sort of has a tendency to uh, over complicate or overthink things. Am I, I mean, I'm part of that space myself, so I'm probably allowed to say that, but uh, there, is, there is now APIs in Java where you can put an annotation on this, this thing so that some framework then, when you call the method, magically calls uh, or validates that email address with an email regex, what have you. Uh, the funny thing is you don't even need any framework for that because you have a type system, right? You could just like introduce, you can turn that thing that's implicit in the code base, the domain concept, turn it into a type. Um, I probably like took it a bit too far here with first name and last name. There's certain shades of gray, of course, right? But especially for the email address, it, there is there are rules that that um, an arbitrary string has to adhere to to be an email address. Um, so you can say, okay, well now I have to create dozens of tiny classes. Um, but the effect is that compared to this piece of code, by making this concept explicit, um, you can actually be sure in that very method that whenever you get an instance of that thing, so when the method is called and that instance is not null, that's something we probably have to check still, but um, that thing has to be a valid email address. So you, you basically rely on the type to enforce the domain constraints for you. Right? So you write more expressive code. Uh, if you like, like to dive, uh, 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 dive deeper into that topic, there's a fantastic talk by a guy called Danberg Jonsson, power use of value objects, if you Google that on InfoQ, uh, it's basically a one-hour refactoring of some giant piece of code that's not, really, um, that's not really digestible, and then he's just introducing value objects basically th through the entire talk. And makes it testable, readable, what have you. So the, the thing I want to get to and um, I want to uh, actually end up with here is that the idea of making things that you might carry around in your current code bases in an implicit way uh, and making them explicit is beneficial to a lot of things, to your code base, to your APIs, like your REST APIs, as, we, as we're going to see, and um, then hopefully find an example of what this could actually look like. All right. So the other three um, together, I just want to make this quick too, because um, there's not too much time here. Uh, let, let's say we have some typical e-commerce application. We have customers with a bit of information around it. We have invoices belonging to customers. We have an order that contains line items uh, belonging to customers and um, a product. Right. So no matter what language you actually write your piece of software in, you probably can relate to, to that. And some of you probably already like thinking in terms of database tables and foreign keys and whatnot. But the funny thing is, as informal as this, this kind of diagram here is, there's already way m more information in this diagram than you will ever have in your database schema. Why is that? Um, so what I'm trying to get to is um, thinking about your data model. I think Uwe had it in his talk uh, right now. Don't start with the data models. If you're thinking from the bottom up here, uh, you run into a problem. The problem being that in the database, that relationship, the order line item relationship, is what? Foreign key, right? The relationship between the customer and the order is what? A foreign key. So you see, we've modeled them slightly different here. So we have basically grouped order and line item together and basically made this a reference, the, the order to customer relationship. So there's a difference in our conceptual model between the two relationships. And if you just look at these, at these things on a, on a very low level, on the database level, those, those concepts are just not get expressed, right? Interestingly, that's well, I'm talking about relational databases here. If you're using um, document stores, for example, things like MongoDB, um, there's a difference between the store already differentiates between embedding things like having nested documents and whatnot and relationships to other documents like dbrefs and MongoDB. So even the, the choice of data persistence technology can sort of, by that, influence the way you're sort of thinking unless you're really taking a step back and, and looking at things the other way. So... What we've done here is basically we, we've like, um, just like casually grouped them. They're probably not arbitrarily grouped, but um, 
we sort of created these kind of aggregates of entities, right? And that's what the term that Eric uses, actually. Um, and each aggregate consists of an aggregate root. Um, in this case, we also have aggregates that I didn't model any further, so there's nothing wrong, really, with an aggregate that only consists of a single entity. Um, usually, they're on the product contains other things as well, and the invoices too, so still, right? The, 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 um, the first thing that's important here, and that's also important for um, building REST APIs on top of such constructs, is that aggregates, like as Eric defines them, are uh, defining the, the, the scope of consistency, right? So whenever you, you basically bring the system from state A to state B, you modify one aggregate, one, you could even modify more aggregates, but uh, you should only assume strong consistency within one aggregate, right? With that, just to give you an example, um, let's say we have some kind of minimum total order amount that we want to enforce, right? The order has to have like a 20 euros minimum total amount. If you, if you're not basically route all these calls through the order aggregate. Um, or if you, if you allow your like, coworkers to manipulate line items in the data store directly, insert them, delete them, then there's no way to actually enforce that constraint, right? So what Eric basically suggests, or DDD basically suggests, is to look up the aggregate instance, the current state of the aggregate, then perform some state manipulating uh, operation uh, command on the aggregate, uh, bringing it into a new state and persisting that. That doesn't necessarily have to mean loading all the data out of the database and then uh, like writing it all back. Um, you can be smart about that, of course, but you're not, you're not, you're not, not ever going to... Uh, manipulate line items or add line items like directly to the data store. You always go through the aggregate. Scopes of consistency, right? The other thing is, and that's going to come back in a second as well, is they are the thing that you refer to in aggregates or in, 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 a, in, in such a context, right? So there's, there's all, you always refer to the aggregate root. As you can see here, the order refers to the customer, not to the, uh, not to, not to the payment. There's, an, there's a... Um, a tiny bit in the book, they're saying, okay, whenever you actually refer to a line item or, or uh, what else, uh, to a, th that payment bubble I have up there, you have to assume, um, you can't assume strong consistency anymore. So you, by, by, by pointing to those aggregates, um, you, you basically uh, allow the, the aggregate itself to change because you actually just refer to the thing, right? And that, how that actually comes into play, we're going to see in a second. Right. Um, I have probably have to mention the bounded context thing, but I don't want to go too deeply into that. The idea is that we've currently, or so far, we've looked at this system um, in a very entity-centric fashion, right? Also, probably already coming from our thinking in uh, relational database tables or whatnot. But um, what you actually, um, or what, what Eric actually suggests, or the problem that usually comes up is that if you talk to different departments in your, uh, in your organization and you talk about an order, then the shipment department is probably interested in, let's say, the amount of line items because that might def define the box sizes and uh, maybe the target address because there might be some, some customs specialties here. Um, whereas the accounting department is interested in, in the tax rates of the line items or the products that are referred to by the line items. So different, different departments interested in different things so that this, it's actually an interesting point, that so-called ubiquitous language is not actually ubiquitous across the entire system but only within a certain bounded context. So whenever I say order in the shipment department, I, it's absolutely clear what I mean with that. And it, that could mean so, something completely or slightly different uh, things than when I talk, let's say, about an order in, a, in, the, in the accounting bounded context. Um, and an interesting question comes up, um, how you actually, how these, these bounded contexts interact with each other. Again, I'd like to forward you to, to, the, uh, to Michael Plurit's workshop tomorrow, uh, if you're interested in that. Um, I just mentioned that here because we're going to get to that um, in, in, in code in a bit and how things can, can affect each other there. All right, so. Um, domain events. So, so far we've like sort of discussed structure, right? Um, let's get on to, uh, to behavior, behavior, to the dynamic things. Um, I try to actually shape that into, or the entire, the entire uh, part here into um, explicitness, 
maturity model, right? So how, how explicit is your code, or actually how explicit could your code be? First thing is, um, you just stay where we where I uh, what I mentioned before. You just have your database tables. For each database table, you just create an entity. If you're like if you have to use JPA, for example, it's very easy to do. Um, and then you just like take your entity manager or what what have you, your persistence API, and then just like modify these these operations. Um, What's the problem with that? Um, the client code is actually, or has to have, to do something meaningful, it has to have in-depth knowledge about um, the, the structure of the domain object. So what this giant block of code, excuse us, uh, that's Java. Um, um, what this does is, is basically it adds a line item to the order. And that piece of code, that very procedural style kind of code, um, basically looks in, in the existing list of line items whether there's already an existing one for the given product and then adds the, quant the given quantity to it or um, yeah, just adds a new line item to the, to the, to the order. Right? So we're basically like, taking the order and poking at it and uh, basically um, disassemble it to some degree and then reassemble it in, in the very end. So. That's not very. That's not very explicit. That probably also causes um, that that kind of code to be repeated in a different places in the code base. Um, but again, um, the point I'm trying to get to is how can we make this more explicit in the code in the first place? The simple idea is to focus on the aggregates and say, okay, actually, what we've done there is we've we've taken the ag the order aggregate from one state to another, right? So let's make that an, an, an explicit operation on the aggregate. So instead of like poking at the different things of the order, we can um, actually avoid exposing the line items um, or mutable state of the line items entirely by just like adding that method. It's, it's a very simple thing, but it already raises the level of abstraction of, of, of the code base quite a bit, right? So, that's, that's already better because we now get, have an order class, an order object that we can actually take through different, different uh, states or we can actually take it from one state to another. You already hear that I phrased those things in a, in a certain way that I actually um, segue into, into, into the rest segment. Um, there's another thing that's quite important here. Um, we can, we ha now have these explicit operations, but that actually, sort of keeps those, those, those significant events, I'm not talking technical events, but just business events, um, in the code base. And it's not, there's no way, or they are, the events themselves are not, re not really explicit at all, right? So if in a typical Spring application, you'd probably have something like, like this. We, have, we want to complete the order, and when we complete the order, we actually have to update the inventory, right? I'm ordering a TV, a new TV, uh, so the inventory has to be notified about the update uh, or the, that TV, so that we basically decrease the amount of TVs available. Um, that's I, I see those or that kind of code like in or have seen this in, in gazillions of applications. Uh, you have a transactional boundary here, which just makes everything kind, co kind of convenient. Uh, we um, complete the order, we store the order, uh, the new state of the order, that's actually not bad in the first place, and then we, for each line item, reach out to the inventory and update it, right? What's the problem with that kind of code? What was it? One thing? It's a bit hard, I guess, with, with so many people. Uh, still, it's that there's no way you can actually implement new functionality that reacts on the business event of a completed order without touching that code, right? So let's say we introduce a loyalty program, our customers actually get bonus points for, for, every, for every order. We have a separate team that implements that logic, um, or not a separate team, but some people, some people in the team, because we're still in the monolith here, um, I say we we need, we need this new functionality, and then even if that loyalty program API there is implemented, it works. Uh, we have to touch that code, right? And it's sort of that kind of code becomes some kind of a hog of functionality that's sort of related to the event of um, of the of, for the order completion, basically. Right? And the reason that is, is that we don't treat this event as an explicit thing, it's as an explicit, explicit content, uh, um, explicit concept. That's the, that's the issue here. Right? So 
Now, let's say we have this system and we now we feel that this, uh, developing that system or evolving it becomes problematic and then some guys of the teams come to this conference and they hear about microservices and they uh, decide, okay, we have actually this, this, these three things there, the inventory and the, the loyalty program, this is, and actually that's a different bounded context, right? So we actually have to separate the systems here. So what do we do? We just like go ahead and replace those local method calls and uh, just use a REST template or what have you, just an after HTTP client. And then just like, like call, call posts. And have paint with that, have painted us into a corner that we then even, or that's what I usually see, uh, throw more technology at to try to paint us out again, right? Because um, all of a sudden, the, the error scenarios are much more complicated, right? So we have to, what, what if, that, if that post request doesn't work? Transactionality is actually out of the door, right? There's, 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 no, there's no way we can achieve it. I mean, you could do uh, two-phase commit over to, to uh, coordinate the different systems. Uh, you probably will throw some hysterics on it because you want to retry things or what have you. But actually, the thing is here, we could take a step back and try to avoid the problem in the first place rather than solving the problem. Right? So if we make this domain event kind of explicit, we sort of publish a domain event, whatever technical means we want to use for that, um, we can sort of avoid this integration hog on a point in, uh, in, the, in the order manager here. We can basically like slightly change our code, so the uh, completing the order creates a new object, a new instance of that order completed event, then we save the order, and then there's some API here, in, in this case it's Spring Framework API, but it's also um, available in, in other technologies, like if you're using CDI or some non-Java things, there's probably similar, similar APIs here. We publish that event, and so we basically hand off the, the operation to, um, to any third parties, and everyone that's uh, interested in the order-completed event can now subscribe to this event um, and, and react to it. Right? So you could have, an, basically, the, the inventory could um, just um, add this event listener for that order completed event, and in this case, it would still t uh, take part in the transaction. Um, it would still roll back the transaction if the the update fails here. That might be something you w want to have in in the monolithic scenario. You could also go ahead and um, use a transactional event listener. It's basically delaying the event publication until the transaction commits. In this case, because you probably don't want to send out an email. Um, to some to the uh, to the customer before you actually know the order was completed and this stuff was written to, to the database, right? Um, you probably have, or not sure if you have realized, but this is not really talking about like separate systems or something like uh, an event bus or uh, a message broker or what have you. That's just like the way I structure uh, the the code in the monolith to basically decouple these things, um, and um, so that's doable, completely independent of whether using a system of systems or or just a monolith. And basically, the, in this case, if you if you once you actually w switch to that kind of integration model of, of the bounded context, um, the question of whether the inventory is a separate system is more or less a question of okay, do I actually publish that event outside of my current system's uh, boundaries? Right. I mean, in case of the inventory, we we, we change the transactional semantics here, but um, but still, right? So the 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 important point is like getting making those events, those business events, explicit. And there's a bit of bit of um, lipstick we have for the pig uh, in in a recent Spring Data version because one thing I didn't like about that kind of approach was that all of a sudden my business code now has to interact with the Spring component, the application event publisher interface. Um, we sort of um, tr try to use the the aggregate as probably we've already realized, that's sort of the, the focus of, of where functionality goes, where events actually come from. Um, so there's um, some, some tiny bit of API in, in Spring Data, another way you can just like register these events within the aggregate, and then um, that's all you need to write on the, on the uh, orchestration side of things. So the order management is just looking like that. But that aside, if you want to look or want to know more about that, feel free to approach me after that. All right, so um, 
we've done two things here, and these, these two steps are the, the important ones for, for everything going forward. We've, in the first step, we've, we've made the operation explicit on the aggregate, and then we've used or even made those business events explicit when it, ca when it comes to uh, bounded context interaction. Right? So that's, that's basically the story here. The third level basically, or then usually, is um, CQRS, which, which sort of takes that kind of eventing level um, uh, or that, that working with events uh, to a next level. Actually, um, it's what I've sh shown you so far doesn't fundamentally change the way you persist data, um, the way you like reconstruct the aggregate state, but still gives you a lot of the benefits. That's why I actually made it an, a step in between. Um, with CQRS, you sort of actually just like build the entire rebuild the entire aggregate state from the event log uh, with snapshotting and whatnot. I just leave that here for completeness. The interesting bits for what I'd like to discuss in the remaining uh, minutes are the, 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 the two levels in the, in the middle, explicit operations and some op operations as events. All right, so REST. Um, who of you is writing REST APIs? Wow, quite a few people. So um, one thing I'd like to start with and then like sort of... Um, put some meat behind that claim, actually, is that I've seen a lot of people that like try to go the quick route to produce RESTful APIs by, I mean, the worst thing I've seen is just like database tables, um, code generation of entities, Spring Data repositories on top of that, um, some swagger on top of that, and then be done with it, right? So that's not convenient for a first, for a first version. But um, looking at REST as a CRUD via HTTP has severe drawbacks. And I, I'd like to actually explain that um, on, on an example here. Actually, I'd like to explain you the, the other approach that I'd recommend. And then we basically get to, get to that. I hope we get to that, um, that you agree with me that, that that's the case here. The first thing to pick, to pick us up uh, from the discussion about, about DDD and, or the, a couple of parts of them uh, is some analogy that I, I find kind of interesting, where uh, we started with the aggregates and identified three, diff uh, three important characteristics. So um, the aggreg aggregates are, are things that I can refer to, so they are identifiable. That's sort of two things, uh, different um, sides of the same coin here. And we have the scopes of consistency. And actually, if you, if you think about your HTTP resources that you want to expose, they sh sort of share the same characteristics, right? That then in turn basically means that I think it's not a bad idea to basically look at your domain model, which basically um, assumes you have one in the first place, um, not just like entity generated or database tables generated into entities, um, and then look at where the aggregates are and basically try to shape your resources around those aggregate boundaries. Especially the scope of consistency aspect um, comes in very helpful, especially when it comes to put requests, like, um, well, um, basically um, non-safe um, requests, so things that are requests that modify state, uh, because if, if, the, if the, 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 the borders or the, uh, the scope of the resource aligns with the aggregate, that, that synchronization is of, of state is, is um, much easier than if you have to, like, sort of do two, uh, two or three requests to actually perform a single operation on, uh, on the server or what have you. Right. The other thing that plays into that is that I see people getting over-obsessed with URIs. Uh, I thought, actually I thought we, were, we, we left that behind us, but just recently I've been in, in another discussion where, it, uh, where we just like basically spend an hour discussing URIs. Um, the, the much more interesting aspect is like where are my representation boundaries, and that actually plays into the scope of consistency aspect, right? If you just like if you naively take your um, you take your our our data model, our entity model, right? That's usually then if you have a couple of database uh, database tables, uh, which is like. Um, we had this sample for before. So there was the order, there was the line item, the line item has a reference to the product, the product has a reference to, let's say, the supplier, and the supplier has a reference to its, like, all, the, all the employees and whatnot. Um, so if, if you don't really take the aggregate scopes into account and the, these borders, and you take just 
load that, that order object from the database and then say, Jackson, please go ahead and turn this thing into JSON, then just like, happily traverses the entire tree, and then you not only load your three megabytes of, of data into your database, but also get a giant um, JSON structure. That's not really useful, because you can't just like take that and post that back or put that back, because it just contains everything in the world. Right? So this Finding the, the, um, the, the borders of a, of a resource representation is, an important, um, is important, an important aspect of designing those resources. As I said, I think aligning them with, with aggregates is not a bad idea in the first place, but that actually means that at some point we have to cut things off. Right? So let's say with the order we have the customer, the customer is another aggregate. That means we, prob we don't want to include that in the representation, but what else do we do? We, we need that information that there's some connection there. Interestingly, uh, there's this concept called hypermedia in, in REST that actually allows us to do that, to refer to other things that, um, that exist somewhere else in the system. Right? So, What's hypermedia? The, the fundamental idea is that we're not taking, we're ju not just go ahead and let, let Jackson marshal our person, and we have all the, the actual the, the data items in the JSON, but we also include navigation information. That could be um, just like connection information, like the order could contain a link to the customer that placed the order. Right? So it's, it's basically static data. It's not something that's like very dynamic. It's just like, okay, the order is linked to the customer. There's a link in there. Fine. That's the, the, the simple case. It gets even more interesting if you uh, just like try to, or if you look at the, uh, the thesis that Roy wrote, and he basically described um, uh, the hypermedia as the engine of application state as one of the core constraints of REST. Um, which means there are certain aspects of REST or certain consequences that you get um, from REST, you only get them if you follow uh, that style, right? Or if you include that constraint in your, in your uh, API implementation. So what does that mean? Hypermedia was kind of linking things, right? Hypermedia as the engine of application state now is basically those links don't necessarily have to appear unconditionally, right? They could come and go depending on the resource state which then the client can actually use to drive the resource state. That's what, that's what um, that thing basically describes. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's this book, REST in Practice. Uh, there's this sample in there, um, REST box. It's a Starbucks-like uh, shopping experience. Um, you basically go ahead, you place an order. It's in a certain state called, in this case, payment expected. Uh, in that state, you can actually update the order. Um, and then there's like two major choices. First one is I can pay the order, which then triggers a uh, like preparation process, and then I, um, in this case, I do, do some, use some polling and then uh, pick up the, the, uh, the drinks um, later on and complete the order. And the other, way, the other path is basically canceling the order, right? Um, it's kind of an in in interesting example because it already has some. You see, that's not that's not a typical CRUD REST dish thing, right? So it's it's actually on a on a much higher abstraction level because it sort of uh, formulates a business process really and helps clients implementing those. So if you if you go ahead and just like um, avoid any hypermedia or just like um, go the, the, the way I usually see people go, then they just like take some, take some RAML or Swagger document and then they just like um, define their resources, there's or slash orders, you can post to that to create a new order and then there's slash order slash ID and um, then that allows you to update the order. Um, and what you basically then get if you just like throw some Spring MVC at it or what have you, you just like get resources that just follow the, the, that, that path pattern and they just like expose all the fields that, that your, your, your stuff, uh, your, your data has, in this case the order. So the fundamental question is um, if you actually get to that abstraction level where you sort of have conditional state transitions, how does the client actually know when it is allowed to cancel the order? Like in, prax or in practice, um, if you write an iOS application for that, right, there's, there literally has to be some piece in the code that says, if condition, display cancel button. Right? It's got to be somewhere. So the question is, what does the condition look like? So how does the client actually find out? Right? 
So the option, the only option you have with the approach that I've just shown you, like the, using the URIs and just the plain payload, is inspecting the payload, right? So there will be some documentation saying um, there is this JSON field called status, and it has uh, these three uh, valid values, and there will be payment expected in there, and um, when, when uh, you find that text payment expected, it's in that state, and that's where you can actually uh, trigger the issue, issue the payment, right? I go ahead, implement my, my iOS software, ship that to the Apple Store, you already downloaded uh, that thing, and now along comes business and says, well, actually, it wouldn't be a bad idea if that device is in German, uh, why not like show people um, German text, right? And then that's basically the reaction of the developer team because like they can't just like cha arbitrarily change the value of that status field, right? Like the server team can't can't do that um, because it will inevitably break all the existing clients that were looking for that payment expected thing. So, what's the alternative, right? We could throw some sprinkles of hypermedia into this into into the into the place and say, okay. Guess what? Instead of doing it this way, rather, n let's not tell the client that much about um, our resources and when they actually can show up. But we just like we throw some links into the mix here. We name them. We give them names, and we force the client to look for the links. We just say, okay, whenever there's an orders link available, you can actually post to that resource that is pointed to, and th by that you can actually create an order. And by that we can go ahead and say, okay, um, you can actually cancel the order whenever you find a cancel link. Right? That's much more imprecise in terms of the business rule, but that's actually kind of helpful, and that's actually the point. Um, so you can then, instead of inspecting the payload here, uh, you can inspect or find the link, um, and then display the button uh, only if, uh, if, if the link is present, right? Um, and then basically the, the text is just like, is just plain user-facing text, right? So the coupling, usually the coupling between the implementation, the, the client and the server is not coming from, I have to know there's a first name field, I have to know there's a last name field, but it's coming from the right side of the, of the equation, right? If, if the client inspects the values too much and does things on, on, on top of that, um, that's where the, actual, the coupling comes from. Because what we're actually doing is we replicate business logic that's available on the server, Right? You can only cancel that thing if its payment is expected uh, into the client. And that basically means we have to keep them either in sync or start versioning things, and then uh, things start to go downhill uh, pretty quickly. So what we're, going to, what we're actually doing here is we're reducing the complexity of business decisions to a client, to Boolean yes-no decisions. Right? Another example is permissions. Like, let's say... Um, we have an, it's just an admin interface or something where you can delete customers or users. How, without hypermedia, how do you actually know, or how does the client actually even know whether it can like, present the, user, the actual user some operations, right? Can I delete the customer um, unless there's just a link that says you're allowed to do so? What we're basically doing, and that's the, the, the thing I want to get to to sort of bring things to an end here, is that we're trading two kinds of complexity. And one is the um, protocol complexity, right? Because in my hypermedia example, the client now all of a sudden has to know how to find links in JSON, right? It has to um, yeah, understand the media type, where before it was just like JSON and then probably know about the fields. But... Um, it doesn't have to know about the business, uh, the business uh, knowledge. In, in, uh, so what does, can I cancel the order actually, or what is that actually made up from? To give you, just to make that a bit more graphical, I think, for non-hypermedia-based systems, you have a lot of domain knowledge in the client, right? Domain knowledge meaning, okay, I have to know about the payment expected string, and that, that, that's got to be there, and if that changes, I break. It's very brittle. Right? You have very little um, protocol knowledge because you don't have to care about links. That's fine. Um, but that actually results in stronger coupling between client and server. Whereas, like, the more you can get to the right side of the spectrum here, um, the more you have to teach the clients um, 
protocol knowledge, but uh, less domain knowledge, because basically the, the protocol means give you uh, the means to um, to avoid that domain knowledge leaking into the client. And I mean, the, the fundamental question is here, why would I want to be on the right side just because I painted the right side green? Well, um, yes. Uh, but the thing is, the fundamental thing I think that, 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 uh, that I tried to get across here, just ask yourselves, what's changing more often? Is it your business rules? Or is it like protocol things like HAL, JSON, HTTP? It's your business rules, I guess, right? So the less you can get into the, the get those into the clients, um, the easier it is to change them because you're just like on, you're standing on much more stable ground, really. Um, why do I why why am I so focused around that? Especially if you have uh, like let's say we've discussed this scenario with one server and one mobile application. That's pretty easy. Now it's now start thinking about like systems that communicate with each other, systems of systems. Um, when, you, when you start getting into, into a, let's say, a microservices scenario and then end up that for every little change you want to make to some API of some system, you have to redeploy 15 or 20 others, then you're not, into, not in a, I mean, it might be still a microservices system, but you don't get the benefits of being able to continuously deploy new features, right? So you want to focus on uh, the, the, the ability to make changes in a non-breaking way, and um, that kind of approach actually helps, uh, helps a lot. There's a blog post hidden behind the link, uh, Evolving Distributed Systems, if you just like Google my name in that, um, where I basically spend a couple of screen pages ranting about that stuff. Um, anyway, if you want to see something like that in action, um, there is an implementation of that RESTbox example. There's an original implementation in the book already with JAXRS, and yeah, that's probably it. Uh, like a couple of years ago, I basically took the same sample and was kind of thinking, okay, one thing it would be cool to actually um, yeah have a uh, have a Spring-based implementation, and then along came Boot, and then along came Spring Data REST, yada yada yada. So it's also become a bit of a, a technology showcase um, right now. But um, I just probably skipped the, the discussion of that. Uh, there's the the uh, sample is in my GitHub. If you want to look at that, it has the order process implemented as a as a an, as an integration test. So it's basically going through all these steps, like following the hypermedia links. Um, there's a bit of uh, REST docs in there because the question of documenting those APIs, um, of course, comes up. That's that uh, flows nicely with the idea of of like actually testing the API rather than just like throwing some bloody annotations and your on your methods saying this API call will return status code 201 and two lines below you actually return 204 or something um, stuff that you get with 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 uh, documentation approaches that um, rather want to statically analyze your code and then you basically get the Java doc problem but but worse. Um, the Evolving Distributed Systems blog post I mentioned, there's another one on the benefits of hypermedia APIs, which is basically the, the second part of the talk, which I like kind of unfold a bit a bit broader. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically it for pointers. That's it for now. And with that, I think we have uh, two minutes for questions. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Actually, we have seven minutes for questions. Oh, really? So, yeah. That's funny. So, any questions? I was shooting for the 150, uh, 1150. Uh, have you looked at JSON API and, uh, like, there are, like, a standard for... Yeah, um, so the question is about JSON API. Yeah, I've, I've looked at it. Um, doing a couple of things in slightly weird ways. Um, generally speaking, I'm not too opinionated about the different hypermedia formats. I like HAL quite a lot, and um, that's also one of the reasons that uh, most Spring projects integrate with that in the first place, um, because it's so non-invasive to the actual JSON structure. So with people that have never been wor or working with, with hypermedia before, then it's basically, like in the worst case, two new underscore links, underscore embedded elements in their JSON payload, the rest looks the same, which is give, giving it a kind of low entry barrier, basically. Um, there's also, um, 
I think JSON, JSON API, you said, I always mix them up, JSON LD and JSON API. But um, they, I think they also include much more processing information in the document. I'm not sure whether that, that's... Okay, but that, there's, there's even more advanced uh, hypermedia formats like Siren, for example, that explicitly like spell out the different options that you have that you can, there's not only the link, but also the HTTP method and basically form information. Um, I'm kind of, tor kind of torn on, on that one because I probably wouldn't want like my payload to basically explode with data that's the same over and over again. Hell rather has this kind of, okay, the, the actual payload is the, is the moving parts and there's some other format you describe the actual operations with because you have, can ha uh, serve those from other resources that you cache at a diff completely different rate rather than like transferring all the data um, uh, over with the actual entities. I'm not sure it makes a huge difference if you start putting gzipping into, into, into the mix, but um, it's a bit of a matter of taste, I think. Separate the metadata from the data. Not a bad idea, but in general, I mean, I, I don't really care, to be honest. All right. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, you welcome. mentioned at the beginning you want to bridge between domain-driven design and REST. Mm -hmm. Is there actually anything you can bridge for when you come from domain, uh, um, domain-driven design? That's a, uh, interesting. I've, I've dropped uh, two slides here, actually, where I have um, the, uh, where I listed a couple of things that where, where things don't fit that nicely. Um, or there's some translation step necessary. One thing is data backend identifiers, database identifiers is is a tricky thing if you just like throw them into the representation. Also something that you get if you just like use Jackson carelessly, um, because just the the primary reason being that REST has a concept for identifying things, which is URIs, right? And then you basically as soon as you start with aggregates and aggregates being composed of different entities, you usually have kind of inter or in document identity uh, which is kind of a weird thing to deal with if you think about put requests and what have you especially about collections and ordering uh, in collections that's one thing the other thing is that um, optimistic locking things like adversion annotations or something there's http headers for that right you could uh, use the version information in the in the etag header there's last modification dates or something that you can put into a header. So the general sentiment here being, um, whenever there is a protocol-specific mechanism or concept that you can transfer some backend thing into, then rather do that than just like keeping that around and just having a last modification field in your JSON, right? Because then all the infrastructure that actually knows about those headers can deal with that, caches, what have you. So. Um, there's a bit of stuff if you're using like Spring Data REST is sort of the, the, the REST framework on top of the Spring Data repositories that does a lot of these things automatically for you. But um, it's also not, not a bad idea or something you should look at if you're like manually coding a REST API, which is totally fine. Um, all right, one in the back. There you are. Uh, and, uh First slides, you had uh, an example about adding uh, line items to orders. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, give a short idea how to to uh, implement it with REST and links? Um, actually, that's, that's a funny thing that that comes up because it was a, I gave that talk a, a week ago at OOP conference in Munich, and um, we basically came to the same question. The unfortunate thing is that I didn't take the time to um, to uh, I wanted to get to this here, right? To rather make this explicit add operation. Um, the RESTbox example, the implementation, doesn't really take that thing and make makes it an explicit operation. But in the end, it's just it's it's a good idea to do that, and it, it should be done here for that example. Uh, it's basically just like in that in that particular state, you just add a new link that then maybe takes an URI to a product. And, uh, and an amount, so you just define the payload for that, and then that basically maps the operation, really. So uh, that's why I actually got to the point where I say, okay, moving those methods into the aggregate is key to actually identify what kind of link relations I might want to expose in my API, right? Without having these explicit operations, and then going forward the explicit events, um, it's, it's hard to just like see the forest for the trees, because otherwise all you do is like poke at data 
Of course, you can just go ahead and uh, issue a patch request to that resource, and then it's the client's responsibility to do the right thing, put the right things in the right place, but that's exactly the stuff you want to avoid leaking into the client. And then an explicit um, um, link relation that just shows up while the resource in a certain, is in a certain state, right? As soon as you've paid the order, you can't add things anymore. It's basically something you could communicate there as well. So just m add link relations for, for the important operations or important state transitions. That's the, that's the better, better question. Okay, uh, final question. Final question. We, we can sort things out later on, that's fine. Or... Okay, um, if I think about DDD, I still think about object orientation, mm -hmm. and I don't think about REST or some other kind of architecture, I exchange objects. Which is a good thing, yeah. Um, so, um, why uh, do we talk about these two topics at one? Um, um, so, the thing is that, uh, of course, DDD, um, the, the, core fo the focus is, as the subtitle of the book says, tackling the complexity in the heart of software. Uh, just like building that domain model that expresses the domain that you're dealing with and whatnot. The unfortunate thing is, at some point, having that code only is not enough. Right? You have to like someone has to be able to use your your system and has to to actually um, interact with your system. Uh, so there's got to be a step in the hexag hexagonal architecture. You have this in, in the ports and adapters layer outside um, on the on the very outside. Basically, there's some kind of translation step, right? And the question I just like I wanted to sort of answer or cast some light on is. Um, if you think, or if you if you focus on certain things in 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 the in the DDD space, um, what makes it easy to actually create that translation? Right? You can you can still build a REST API on if if you just like completely ignore aggregates and what have you. It's still going to be a lot of fighting and mitigating and mapping and what have you. And if you follow or focus on not not really focus, but if you're if you're looking at certain things and don't forget about certain things in the, uh, in let's say aggregates and what have you, that translation step is becoming dramatically simpler, if not even possible at all in the first place. So, do we are we cut off? Okay, so I, I uh, still thanks. don't don't want to to uh, that rest take impact on my DDD design. I want right, to keep it. That, okay, that if, if, if that was what was coming across, definitely. The, my, my point was, okay, look at the, at the model first, of course, model your domain, and then uh, my point was rather, if you forget about modeling parts of the domain, and that's what I unfortunately see in some teams, then the rest thing on top of it is becoming much harder than if you do DDD right in the first place. Okay, sorry. Okay, we can think, t take other things offline. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thanks a lot. Um, take care.